in the many years since the independent publishing within the RPG world has really taken off, I have wondered to myself how it is to be sitting around a table with a GM using some material that is so lovingly designed and so visual when the GM's the only one with the book. Presumably the GM's the only one with the book because these are typically very GM focused books. And this one, Rackham Vale, is no exception. This is fantasy adventure from the art of Arthur Rackham. And it is, well, let's start by let's start by first looking, taking a look at the back here to show you information about Arthur Rackham. He lived from 1867 to 1939 in London. He was a Londoner and he was a book illustrator of, as it says here, a leading figure of the golden age of British illustration. He contributed iconic artwork to fairy tale collections and there many of them are listed here. Brothers Grimm, Mother Goose, Aesop's Fables, etc., A Midsummer Night's Dream, as well as other art, fantasy art. He received widespread acclaim and numerous awards throughout his career, and his work has inspired countless visual artists, filmmakers, etc. And the setting here, Rackham Vale, is inspired by and indeed is populated by, the book is populated by and uses the his art. And I'm going to take, we're going to take a look at a lot of that here. Inside the book, it is black and white. There are, however, color postcards of the, I think it's 18, I'm not sure, I'll put the exact number up, maybe 24, monsters or enemies in the bestiary and the back of the card has their stats and has information about them and in some cases also refers you to more tables about them in the book. Before we get into looking at what this setting really is and talking about how it could be used as a soloist and I do plan on doing a play demo of this. So there's going to be a second video, at least that's my plan. This is designed stat-wise to be used with old school essentials. I think you could probably put it into other systems if you were uh, facile at kind of massaging stats like that, but it is it has the stats for old school essentials and it is my plan to use it in a demo. I had wanted to I had wanted to do some kind of overland thing anyway, because I haven't really done a ton of overland solo demos on the channel, and I'm interested in doing that. And this arrived from Brian Saliba, who contacted the channel to ask if I was interested in it, and indeed I was, and he very kindly sent me not only the book, but a set of these cards, and then came coming in the book is a postcard of this area. It is a map of the area. This is also reproduced in the book in slightly different detail. And we will take a look at this as we get into it. It does surprise me when when I when I was made aware of this, I thought to myself, wow, what a great idea. And why hasn't anyone done this? I don't think, maybe I'm wrong. You can let the channel know. I, I don't think there's so much um classic out of copyright art that could be incredibly evocative art that could be picked up and used in this manner. And to my knowledge, this is the first setting, RPG setting that does so. And it does so in a fantastic and very loving way. So let's see what does the what do the designers have to say about this book on the back? It says, while the world when the world was 100 years younger, during the golden age of British book illustration, Arthur Rackham and his paint box gave birth to some of the most transportive, iconic, and magical images this or any world has ever seen. His work brought to life characters and settings from famous fairy tales, ancient mythology, and timeless classics. In Rackham Vale, these images are given new life for use in your tabletop role-playing games. 
the characters, creatures, and scenes that Rackham captured become NPCs, villains, and a hidden veil setting that can be dropped into any RPG campaign that could do with a touch of magic, mystery, and old-time weirdness. In this mini setting sandbox, you'll find adventure, weird creatures, dark sorcery, and oodles of riddling, tricksty, ribald fantasy folk. This zine contains an original map with 18 key locations, a faction spread that charts relationships for easy reference, dozens of adventure hooks, the illustrated bestiary that's 24 new creatures based on interpretations of Rackham's art, tables for generating new settlements and creatures that fit the setting, a prep list for GMs, and stats for OSE, although the setting is compatible with and easily adapt to other systems, and of course the book of illustrations by the master himself. We have the publisher name here, and again the credits, we'll actually take a look at the credits inside here before we get into discussing this a bit more. As stated, there is an introduction where we talk about what Rackham Vale actually is with a prep list for GMs. And I will say that as we're going to go through this, my slight bias or inclination is to talk about this as to how I would use it as a soloist. Obviously, the a GM around a table may use it slightly differently, or there may be some similarities, but I'm going to be showing you what's inside with an eye toward how you could use this as a resource for solo play. Welcome to Rackham Vale. Inspired by and featuring the illustrations of Arthur Rackham, this narrow alpine valley is a mini setting that can be dropped into fantasy role-playing games with specific plot hooks or stumbled upon by adventurers trekking through remote mountains. It is a sandbox with several possible storylines, but no set sequence of events. And of course, this is useful to all GMs, whether soloists or not. There, in the book, there is this construct of some secrets. So you can, if you're playing with traditionally with players, you can collect secrets, collect from each player any and all of the secrets that their PCs have. And then throughout the book, material is underlined and the underlined material is meant to be a secret or to be sort of revealed slowly. This is really interesting, I think, for a GM with other players and would be useful to easily see something that you could retain or hold back. I don't know how much relevance it has here in any event. It's suggesting that you can do um, random roles for encounters. There's some very light rules here about having keeping track of the way magic is used and having some of the environment um, at, react to the players on certain on certain roles. Helpfully, um, the authors tell us what's not in this scene. So in the map, you'll see many different places that aren't necessarily developed here. It would be more material than is present here. And one of them, for example, is this Limps March. It, uh, it says it's witchy, boggy, and herby, but what else? And that was one of the things that's over here that caught my eye initially. For some reason, i drawn to that as a place to start. This is by Stinkwood, and I don't know. So it is helpful to know that some of this is not going to be developed, and you can develop that or would develop that on your own. Here is this map shown slightly bigger. This is this is great to have, but it's a little hard, at least for, for me to read, needing to go back to the eye doctor. I was using a magnifying glass to sort of see what's what. Here's Limps March over here. And I just like the sound of that. I don't know why. The, there's a yapple tree, copper mines. There's a absinthe tower, old keep road. There's the old keep up there. There's that pixie peak. And here's that pixie pit. And then you, I think I skipped the table of contents. So then we get into the the sites that are that are developed in the book. And then we also have the bestiary here. And then in the middle, we've got this, the discussion of the factions and the adventure hooks. So the reproduction of the sites, again, it is in black and white, which is 
one would want color, but I definitely understand why there isn't color here because it the the printing costs on color are just so exorbitant. But the cards are in color and they we're gonna get to those at the end. And these are extremely evocative and I think would be worth the purchase in addition to the book if you are playing because it would add just so much. So we have a description here of what the setting is, and then we have an indication of who is here with some enough little rules and things to give you an opportunity to use some mechanics to make it come alive. So for example, if we wanna cross this river, there is a one in chance of a Leviathan attack, and for every 10 gold pieces we toss into the river, we can reduce that attack. So this gives a little bit of a built-in rule and a way of interacting with the environment, something to indicate what's interesting about it. And there is a danger of poison. And then we have a D12 table for what the symptom and the effect would be. And there's also an indication, a D18 table. This is curious to me. I don't know why it would be D18, but instead of D20, but there's a D18 table here of encounters and motivations that that could be had here. So I guess you would just roll your D20 and ignore some results. What's great about this book is really almost all, I don't want to say all because I haven't looked at every single page, but many, many, most of the tables are numbered. Again, here's a D16 table. I guess, you know, it can be hard to come up with maybe four more things. I get that. But uh, you, as a soloist in particular, if you are interested in just having something come up randomly, it's very helpful to helpful to have. And then I suppose you could make a determination that if you rolled over a number that was on a table, you could just select your own or re-roll. The Vale High Road. So the Vale High Road goes through Rackham Vale. This is the Vale High Road here, all along here. And it says, the cobbled thoroughfare of Rackham Vale, which follows roughly the southwesterly course of the Golden River. Who or what is here? Merchants and mercenaries, herbalists and highwaymen, opportunists and outlaws. So really everybody is here. Those who keep moving on sections of the road within the Golden River are not usually attacked by the Leviathan. Those lingering are, so that's a two in 10 chance. So you could create a system for passing of time or when you would need to roll on that. What's interesting about it, it's paved with headstones. Indeed, the road itself is the cemetery of the Vale. Important folks are honored with brass-plated headstones, which erode less quickly, resulting in cart jostles and toe stubbings. Travelers are advised to tread carefully, as kicking or stumbling on a headstone is said to disturb the spirit resting below. Lots of beware voracious river monster, trotting recommended signs where the road hews close to the river. So this is a very economical way of already creating a feeling and emotional uh, setting for this place. We have a D12 for encounters and motivations, and here is the table laid out there. And then we also get some interior settings. So this is the King's Head Tavern. This is a large roadside inn, capacity 100, and home of the King's Head Tavern. Who's here? All sorts of mortal folk. Seelies are generally tolerated. Now there's two types of, I skipped over this in the front here. There's um, there's Seelies, which are known collectively at the Seelie court, although not all Seelies participate in court life. So these are brownies, elves, fairies, gnomes, leprechauns, mermaids, nixies, pixies, selkies, and sprites. And then there's neutral creatures here, centaurs, dryads, griffins, etc. And then there's the unseelies, the bogarts, the boggles, the bugbears, the changelings, the goblins, etc. So, and then there's malevolent m mythological creatures and a whole long list of those. Now, there aren't stats here for all of these. So you would need, if you imported any of these, you would need to get the stats from somewhere. And I don't think... I'm sure, actually, not all of these are, say, for example, in Old School Essentials, but that would be something if you decided to bring this in that you would need to then uh, accommodate. So that's what that's what the reference to Seelies here. So Seelies are generally tolerated, and the King's Head is considered by those vacationing in the Forest She, that's this area 
here to be very a uh, very fashionable dining spot. They look down on the food but love the ale and mortal watching. And then there's a couple of um, NPCs, including Nibs, a, a little dog. And here's an example of what is a secret that a GM could hold back from players. It's a dog that is actually a mischievous brownie, which has discovered that if it plays pranks while in the form of a dog, it is not subject to the Pixie Pit's punishment. What's interesting about it, this becomes in the structure of a tabletop game with players and GMs a secret. In an abandoned root cellar is an illicit duppy cap that is, uh, we'll show you the duppy caps, duppy cap den run by the mining collective. Here the desperate and depraved sip duppy cap tea, smoked dried duppy caps, and eventually become duppy husks, which are experimented on by the mining collective to bolster its workforce. The, as you could imagine, perhaps the duppy cups let's find them here so these are the duppy cups they are magical mushrooms that convey curses and you can see them here and then the duppy husks that are referred to are these are essentially like well people who have eaten too many of these magical mushrooms and you can see the stats on the back so the duppy cups we have the OSE stats here, and there's a section on all of the cards that tell you sort of how you can role play this, this NPC or this enemy. Duppy cups are not sentient, but if a mortal comes within sniffing distance, they will emit spores that can compel victims to pick, wear, or eat them. What they are, they're magical fungi that grow wherever an unseelie is slain as the unseelie's final bit of malignant trickery. When picked and used ornamentally by mortals, they grant incorporeal abilities temporarily. Ingesting them grants additional powers, but such usage grants a cursed immortality, turning them into duppy husks, which are emaciated, feeble folk who are unable to die by any means other than the hands of an unseely. So these are the duppy husks, and they also come with their... So the role-playing of them is confused zombies. They're mortals cursed with feeble immortality. And they who what they are is they mortals who've fallen victim to the Duppy Cup curse. And the so for the Duppy Husks, for example, they have spores from pores. Anyone within two feet must save versus spell or have a strong desire to immediately go to the nearest Duppy Cup growth, no matter how far away. And as mentioned, they can only die at the hands of an unseelie and violently at that. And then back to the duppy caps, um, they are spore, they have spore spray poison. They are not sentient, but if a mortal comes within sniffing distance, they emit the spores. We already said this. They have a curse, and there's information about this. The allies are their unseelies in that they are both a malignant prank of slain unseelies and the creators of victims for living ones. So you can see where populating your environment will be it's very much a living environment here so back to this tavern we are instructed that in these are in the root cellar so even just with this one page of information just right here at this tavern you could easily create a story for yourself where you needed to either get some of these and bring some or use them to poison someone or something and we haven't even gotten to the adventure hooks let's look on 57 and just see if we were starting here what how we might use these so there's a discussion of veil adventure hooks if the pcs aren't beginning their adventuring careers in the veil and you were looking for a reason for them to go there here are some overarching hooks you can toss their way and so th this is not a numbered table but you could easily create a numbered table one two three four five six seven with these eight entries and roll for it so if you did do that you would then let's just do that and see let's just get something on the fly so we rolled a one the PCs are hired as caver caver caravan guards for a shady merchant who is planning an expedition to a remote mine rich in copper. He intends to trade scientific equipment and tomes on zombie and golem control for copy copper ingots. 
the mining collective is experimenting with turning duppy husks into mine workers. Well, we just referred to the duppy husk. They lack newfangled contraptions and techniques, but they've got plenty of copper and a duppy cap den under the Vauxhall Inn. Well, as we said, and King's Head Tavern. After a stopover at the Vauxhall, the PCs will travel to Absinthe Town, where they're likely to get tangled up in mining collective business or even be sold as slaves to them. Now, Absinthe Town, I think I saw that here, is is over here. I actually thought it said Absinthe Tower, but I see now it's Absinthe Town. So I don't know where the Vauxhall Inn is, but you would be starting and going there. We'll go back to, we also skipped over this faction. So there are factions and here's the absinthe town and the mining collective is here little the gutter here is um eating up the text so this might have been laid out differently or edited down to fit with a bigger margin but it says this chart is not comprehensive nor can it convey nuances of relationships or opinions of individual folk. It is meant to serve merely as a general illustration of veil vale group dynamics and as a quick reference that will allow GMs fielding questions from PCs to keep play going without pouring over specific entries. In cases where no specific relationship is indicated, it might mean that the two factions are unaware of each other, don't hold much of an opinion one way or the other, or have a strong opinion of the GM's choosing. Note, Clergy here is representative of how most traditional, i.e. lawful, good theistic religions have viewed fey folk. Whether or not such groups or religions exist in the game, of course, is up to the GM. Very basic key here, uneasy hostility to open warfare, doing business of some sort, love, general opinion up to the individual or group. So here is the mining collective and actually every linkage it seems to have is to do business of some sort so i mean that makes some some sense here you know you'd have to do some development here obviously there are sp creature specific adventure hooks and we've been talking a lot about the duppy husk so there's an option of three here there's um rumor has it that a duppy cap duppy cap i keep calling them duppy caps cups <laughs> duppy cap den is an operation somewhere there, folks with nothing to lose or more curiosity than sense in, indulge in duppy cap ingestion experimentation, find and shut down this nefarious enterprise. And then it says it's parentheses, it's in the basement of the Vauxhall Inn. So we kind of know that. Um, and again, this is designed for a GM playing around a table. So you would have to modify as you saw fit. And there are many creature specific adventure hooks and the creatures are again ones we will get into to show you for example let's just do this right now the veil giants i love giants veil giants gobstack and gob trotter totter have been banned from banquets having brought a huge sack of live goblins to a recent one many goblins escaped and several conspired to poison yearling sheep in anticipation of the next banquet Many Vale Giants were terribly ill and a few even died. Gobstack and Gob Totter really want to attend the next banquet. Can you help? Well, this gives some sense of a flavor of, a, despite this is really a kind of quote unquote weird setting. It is a, has some lightness about it as weird settings do, as well as some darkness about it. And here, here are the Vale giants or a veil giant and it tells us that they are role-playing aspect is they're generally friendly and helpful if a bit doltish except in the week before a banquet when they're demanding threatening and extra doltish at non-banquet time they may just play around want some food from you and that's it but the week before the banquet they are more aggressive about this they're a bit smarter than hill giants, they're closer relatives and not nearly so brutish and cruel, extremely helpful but off, also awfully lazy, which means they depend wholly on smaller Vale residents for their sustenance. Fortunately, they only eat three times a year, but when those times are nigh, woe betide any farmer or villager who won't repay all those favors the Vale giants did for them with a donation to the banqueting table. And it tells you about all the banquets what they like, 
folk would appreciate all the nice and helpful things been done for them and they like bards and again this was indicated as a secret here that you could reveal to your players if you wanted what they don't like they don't like negotiations involving math neither do i and they don't like being called lazy and they have their secret ally is the questing beast who lairs in the dungeons of the old keep a secret the giants guard carefully for some reason we have their stats and we have a specific sort of attack that they do. So there's a look at that card. And we're just going to take a look at a couple more of the cards. Again, the art is very evocative and lovely. This is the damsel in distress. She's really a malignant water spirit. She can peer into the souls of those who fall under her spell and will do or say whatever is most likely to result in a rescue attempt. So she lures you into, she tailors her experience to the desires of those under her spell. This can create confusion if potential rescuers stop fighting long enough to share details of her appearance or demeanor. That's a very interesting fact. Those who resist her spell see nothing at all. She is a mysterious incorporeal entity that manifests on bluffs overlooking the Golden River. She always appears to be in distress tied up cowering under a tree unconscious and dangling pre precariously above the river and so forth passers-by feel the strong compulsion to her so you can see uh, again how you could create if you were walking along the the river here you could create a an easy roll one in six or whatever to have her appear to determine whether or not your character would be able to resist her and then if not to have some combat or some type of interaction with her we have some root trolls root trolls are color mad unsealies they are these nasty little unsealies are not actually trolls or even related to them, but they are ugly and often seen crawling from their lairs under trees, hence the misnomer. They are so sensitive to colors that they can smell them. Red gives off such a strong and pleasing odor that root trolls have become fine connoisseurs of, or dangerously addicted to, depending on who you ask, it. They are obsessed with collecting anything of that color, particularly things that remain red, so roses and blood are nice, but rubies and cardinal feathers are extremely dear. As unsealies, their preferred methods are traps, trickery, fraud, and burglary, etc. And they have arcane magic, and again, this chromic sensitivity. Description invites a great deal of on-the-fly thinking and story development for you. This I love. This is a weather vane and that is a v-a-i-n it's a sentient weather manifestation what are they sometimes in the veil weather conditions give rise to vistas so stunning that they take the form and gain self that they take form and gain self-awareness they become weather veins mystical entities of great power and caprice again you could create a a weather table or you could create I think probably what I'm going to do in just looking more, a little more closely at these is go through and create a, an environmental, random environmental table based on this material that I will roll on and then depending on what's going on, it will or won't manifest one of these, somebody from the bestiary, one of these, one of these entities. We have the, um, the gold, the king of the golden river. A usurped Sealy River Monarch. So this is like a leprechaun folk. It looks like he was uh, he was in charge of this Golden River in some way. And I'm not going to get into those details and leave you to find that out on your own in the interest of time. Here's a good prince. He's a cursed warlord. So maybe he's he's a human prince turned into a toad by a witch. So there he is wandering around and what he likes, what he doesn't like, what he wants. He, course he wants to be a toad again here we have a feral owl oh you know it's funny look that looked like a cat to me I thought that was a cat I guess it's a feral owl it's a predatory feline raptor the aloofness and disdain of a pampered house cat with a ravenous of a raptor ravenousness of a raptor okay well that tells you uh, uh that tells you a lot about that character and that's the thing that's really 
lovely, I think I've used that word a couple times here, lovely about this setting and the, the using this art as inspiration really does elevate it into something else. It is its own thing and it is familiar, of course, to fantasy and weird fantasy players, but yet contained as its own thing and really invites the development of story and ideas and feelings based on the art and really looking closely at the art and I didn't even read those stats but now I'm just going to be showing you some of these cards and you can this is Bella the Brella the spook she is a or he is a demon here and I didn't actually show you in some cases okay here's one so this is this is the questing beast it's an immortal philosophical beast and we do have the familiar layout here of these are some of the secrets how to role play it what it is what it likes what it hates what it wants um, and then you can see referred to here the book so in some cases as I mentioned earlier in the video there are there's additional information about this whatever it is in the book that wouldn't necessarily fit on the card so here's the questing beast entry in the book and it does reproduce some of this information but then we have some more information here on it oh, actually there's really not that much more information but in some cases the, um, there are actually additional tables so here's one example and I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about it but this is the this is the new no moon crone uh, her corporeal form she's a secret hoarding witch and there's a whole information here and in the back there's a way of keeping track just for her to see if you wanted to go this route to have time passing and to create a a moon phase for her so that you knew what form she took when she appeared and I don't know I mean this is this in and of itself is quite interesting because it if you chose to go that route and maybe I will when I develop my story I don't know I don't know that's for the other video but um, having a deciding to go with a structure like this where you're keeping track of either this is the moon moon phases and I'll have to read exactly the suggestion of how to do this not only is going to help control this particular character who maybe could be maybe this character could even be like some sort of guiding force or deity who is um, prayed to in some manner maybe I'll maybe I will go with that and she could be the overall guiding force I don't know now I'm getting off the book structure here but thinking um, you could see how it just spurs imagination that as a soloist having some type of external structure like that suggested by the rule set can be really helpful because it can guide the the narrative in a way to to bring it forward and give you a sense of progression and a sense of achievement and having those type of elements almost like a turn order or time passing or a delimited amount of time that you're spending in a session as I've talked about in many many videos and mentioned elsewhere that can be quite useful because it makes the totally open-ended sense less overwhelming in any case totally off topic here but just to show you that even within this one particular character she has a lot of develop she likes being pursued she likes being or this is the questing beast excuse me I'm picking up the wrong picking up the wrong card here so she is a powerful sorceress an extractor of secrets and a blackmailer extraordinaire she takes various forms depending on the time of the day in the moon phase but she can only take physical form on nights in which the moon an anathema to her is not in the sky so you would need to get into the details of this tracking if you wanted to follow the rules and use her this way and I don't want to leave this video without showing you the tables at the end for creating settlements and creatures 
There aren't too many of them, but they are pretty effective. They're D20 tables, so here, for example, is it's really a 3D20 table to, for example, create a mortal site and settlement. So you've got a 4, 18, and a 6. You, that would be a church, monastery, or nunnery with 2D6 nobles or aristocrats. And the what's interesting about it is this, this table is a little... The formatting on this isn't great. It's hard to see where things start. I think this says occasionally rude youth bar the way and demand a fair, but that doesn't really work here. So we would probably need to re-roll on that table. And we got a one. Inhabitants are in possession of 1D4 secrets. So there you go. This That would be a mortal site. And some of the sites listed, there's a campsite, a hunting lodge, a pavilion, an orphanage. They have settlers, hermits, escaped slaves, prospectors or miners, and then the what's interesting may or may not work. So for example, it's built in the boughs of a huge oak. A sumptuous and decadent feast is underway, entirely grown over with envines. Those are, I think, in the bestiary. Everyone's name begins with the same letter and they are only able to experience emotions that begin with that letter the result of a seely prank. So you'd need to use a little imagination there for the, um, if you wanted to develop it that way. And then we have Fey settlements and sites here. And so we have the same situation with the, uh, so here we would get a, a market with disguised as, as disguised as something we have to roll again, but actually roll again. So we would, I guess it would be a market with I'm not sure what table we would be rolling on there. Maybe maybe we would go to the front here for the fey characters or the um, the Seelies. So it's disguised as, say, an elf, but it's really a Nixie or whatever. And what's interesting about it, seeds planted nearby grow into giant beanstalks. Again, may or may not be useful to you, but um, I think... I think for me, the settlement aspect would probably be the most if I was having, if I was doing some travel along the road or whatever. We have also a 2D20 table for creatures. So here would be an anthropomorphized woodland creature or insect that can be held at bay only by a certain mundane kitchen item salt, dry thyme, pickles, etc. So no stats here, just imaginative ideas, just ideas for you. And then the book ends with the a list of backers and super backers. I guess this was a Kickstarter and maybe I should have said that or don't know it, but in any case it is available now for purchase. So that is a brief look inside, not so brief look inside Rackham Vale. It is, um, I do plan on doing a demo, as I said, and when I work, when I do the demo, I will show you, as I do in my videos, in my solo demo videos, I will show you how I use the material that's provided to structure a setting, to come up with the overarching mission or goal or ideas of the setting because I do tend to at least at the outset have some concept of of that of course things can develop and go in mer in various different ways I think for GM traditional GMs playing around a table having these cards would be great because you could really you could hand them out to your players in some manner and um, and it would just it would I think involve them in a way that, um, as I said at the outset of the video, having these great physical products is amazing for the GM, but it sort of is um, unequal for the players, and then it relies on the GM's ability to convey all this great information. Maybe playing here with the map there is, as I said, a poster-sized version of the map could be helpful, but these cards are really, let's see, what is this? Oh, this is the Serpent Tangle, a 20-headed serpent guardian. That is really cool. It's a little hard to figure out which way you're meant to be looking at the card. 
He is the guardian of the Yapple Tree, a monstrous knotted mass of tw- 20 deadly serpents that scuttles around on a pair of clawed feet with alarming speed and agility. Well, that seems like something you would definitely want to avoid if you could. And as you can see, just even flipping through the cards, it's making me really want to. This is a mercury poison Sealy River Monarch. Maybe you could help him in some way. It, there's, there's just, it, this is so fertile. This is just, this is so fertile. Deep Forest Unsealy. And it really is a brilliant idea. I love this guy here. The minuscule fey influencer. <laughs> I just absolutely love the concept of this. And the use of this incredibly classic and detailed art is such a creative way to have a starting point for a setting and it will allow you it will give you both something very concrete to work with visually concrete and also narratively concrete in terms of what the designers have added in here and have developed here because it's not just the art that the every setting with the encounters and the motivations and then some background as to who or what is here and even the level of secrets it's all just so there for you to use as you would reading right through it or picking and choosing and developing it it's just incredibly rich it really truly is and um, I'm really excited to show you how I work with the material in a future video as I said but I hope that this look inside Rackham Vale gave a fair sense of what is offered here it's called a zine but honestly I you know I was gonna look up like what is technically what a zine means to me this is not a zine this is a book it is a supplement it's an RPG fantasy adventure supplement for stats with OSR oh excuse me OSE old school essential stats but modified or modifiable to other systems